I have heard about McKenzie's exercise class before, and I know some people uh, have participated in it. Um, the interesting thing is Dan, if you don't know, is the all-time record holder for the decathlon at Marshall University. So he's an elite athlete, and look what his wife did to him. So <laughs> that's a, a great, again, once again, it almost feels like I could say, well, there's, there's the message for you, but uh, since I prepared, we'll, we'll go on. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, being away uh, is, is always, uh, it's always refreshing, but um, being outside of your own church family, church community, uh, is, is also enlightening. Faith and I went to the Hilton Head Presbyterian Church, which is a PCA church, Presbyterian Church of America, a very good denomination. It was a wonderful service. Um, we enjoyed it. We, we enjoyed, you know, seeing the building. The pastor had a wonderful message. Uh, people were friendly. You got a little cup that says Hilton Head Presbyterian Church. But, but when you realize it, when you sit back, you say, well, it's, it's really not my community. Now, in a larger sense, of course, it is. As, as Christians, we all belong to the same church family whether we're here, whether we're there, whether we're Presbyterian or Methodist or Lutheran or Independent, as long as we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, we are part of a, uh, the same church family. But we, we belong to specific church communities and church families. And this is really important. And one of the things that has been coming through to me in this One Another series is just how much all these one another sayings in the Bibles, how much they really push us to and require us to live in community. And that's something that's really kind of antithetical to our society. You know, American history is replete with that rugged individualism. And we get that and we appreciate that. There's, there's something unique about America and that people really um, take, take such great initiative. If you've been in other countries, you can see there are differences the way we do things as opposed to some other countries. And, and that's a positive, it's a benefit, it's a plus. But one of the downsides to that is that we never really feel like we can drop our guard and completely be uh, in relationship and community with one another as the early church depicts it. And the problem is that we need one another, not just for the ordinary issues of life, but spiritually to walk one another, with one another. And so we've been, we've been studying these one another sayings in the Bible uh, since June. We'll be going throughout them through the summer. And today we're looking at one of, one of my favorites is bear one another's burdens or carry one another's burdens. The word can be translated either way. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, my vacation started with moving my daughter's apartment in Morgantown. Uh, Hannah went from the main campus down to the medical campus. And uh, Danny and I and Faith went up there to move her one day. And I'll tell you what, I'm not a real fix-it kind of guy. It, also on vacation, our water reducing valve in our house went out, so we had to call a plumber and something in our furnace. That was my vacation was bookended by service calls on each on each end. I don't know how to do that stuff. I got to call the experts. But one thing I can do is carry things. This squat, thick build of mine is good for putting things on your back and burdens and carrying them. And that's what we did. We'd carry Hannah's new apartment uh, stuff out of our house, out of you know, where it was, and bring it up to her new apartment six, uh, on the sixth floor. I can do that. I can bear those kind of burdens. And, and in some way, that's what the Bible means about helping one another, but it goes even deeper than that. It's not simply about just helping one another. It's about walking with one another spiritually, helping one another when we stumble, when we fall, because we all do. Because I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just answer in your heart. Have you ever stumbled in sin? Yeah, I have. Okay. I say, have you ever stumbled in sin this week? Yeah, I have. You know, I could say, have you ever stumbled in sin this day? Today, you probably, you know, say, yeah. Uh, we're not perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And one of the ways, just like Mackenzie and Dan illustrated, is God gives us one another to walk this life of faith and to be strengthened. And it's really one of my favorite ones because it's so doable, but it requires us to actually come closer to one another and not further apart. And the problem with the Western church, really the American church, is that we kind of do drive-bys. You know, we're, we're, we're part of a church, but we're never really part of a church. Um, we're going to explore what that means today. Uh, in Galatians, uh, Paul has just gotten done in chapter 5 talking about life in the spirit versus the sinful life. And he lists what it means to live 
uh, according to the Spirit. And then part of that is this kind of mutual accountability that we have with one another. And this is really important. You know, I'll say this, David Fox uh, sitting right there. David is my running partner. David and I run all the time. There are so many mornings that I would not get up to run except that I know David is going to be waiting for me at the fountain at Ritter Park, and I can't leave him there hanging. So being in this relationship pushes me to do something that, well, I'd rather turn around and get, you know, half an hour or more sleep. But being in this relationship helps me do what I know I need to do. Without that, I probably, I actually probably wouldn't run as much. And it's kind of the same way spiritually. Paul, after getting done talking about life in the spirit versus the sinful life, he's saying that, okay, we live in the spirit. This is now part of the mutual accountability we have with one another. And in chapter 6 of Galatians, he says this. He says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. And we're going to unpack those words later. But he says, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Now, that's a, we're not really going to talk about that part. There's a really interesting thing right there. When Paul talks about the mutual accountability we have with one another and that how we're supposed to be there for one another, help one another as we walk, he says, you know, just remi- remember, watch yourself. Remember, you too are a sinner, and remember, you too are as liable to get caught up in something as anybody else. There was a phenomenon that was really interesting. Uh, after 9-11, you know, it seems so long ago now, but after the attacks, there were so many 9-11 widows, and I don't know if anybody ever heard of this, but the 9-11 widows, you know, who'd lost their husbands, especially it seemed to be a disproportionate amount of women who lost their husbands as opposed to the other way, um, they were grieving, of course, and things like this, and, 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 and friends would go over to, you know, comfort them and everything, and they found that people got caught up in their grieving and that, you know, a lot of these people fell into extramarital relationships. So someone would go, I see some people shaking their head, you've heard that before, some people would go and try to comfort, you know, these grieving uh, widows, and then all of a sudden an inappropriate relationship relationship would develop. Well, Paul is saying here that when we are looking to walk with a brother or sister to help them in their faith, he goes, watch out. Remember, first of all, you're as liable to fall into sin too, and just watch the relationships as you go. But then he says this. He says, bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. So Paul takes this word and he kind of balances that at the end, that, you know, we're called to bear one another's burdens, but remember that we do have our individual responsibility of walking with the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. We give you thanks, Lord God, now in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. You know, in his book, Step Back from the Baggage Claim, author Jason Barger tells of an experience he had one day at the grocery store. The store... Uh, it was one of those giant discount chains. And, and Barger says that the sheer size of it all started kind of making his head spin. And as he stood there in the aisle trying to get his bearings, figuring out where to go, he says he was jolted back to reality by an elderly woman who suddenly whizzed by him, cutting him off and almost running him over with her sharpened cart. The lady, she says, seemingly had no awareness of anybody around her. In fact, So she moved about like she was in a trance. Well, he chuckled about his near hit and run, and then he went on to find what he had come in for. And so he was about then to step to the register. He had a handful of items, three or four items. And he says he, he, he felt that familiar gust of wind as this same woman who had almost run him over suddenly blew by him and cut ahead of him in line. And what's worse, he says, was her cart was piled high with with items and the person behind the register seemed to be moving especially slow that day and of course he began to seethe inside getting more and more frustrated as the minutes passed by he says he began he began fixating on this particular woman how insensitive she was and and her utter disregard of anybody around her 
everything about her irritated him. Even the grouchy vibes, he says, that she was sending out as she was checking out this enormous purchase. And then Jason Barger says, he says, just at the height of my frustration and with my eyes searching for even the smallest opening in another checkout line, he says a woman with a passing cart stopped and called out to the grouchy woman. How's Kenny? The passerby questioned. Not good, mumbled the grouch. The cancer's going downhill, and I'm late getting to the hospital. Obarga says when he heard that, it just floored him. See, he, he'd naturally just assume the worst about this grouchy, self-absorbed woman, supposing she was just in her own little world and didn't care about anything or anyone, but, but it turns out that wasn't the case at all. And in an instant, he said, in an instant, his frustration just melted away when he realized the tremendous burden that this woman was carrying in her life. Now, we don't often realize the burden folks are carrying around, do we? It may not be a loved one fighting cancer. It might be, but the fact is, most of us have got a lot more going on and hidden under the surface than, than we let on. There are health struggles. There are, there are rocky relationships. We've got concerns about our kids. There are paralyzing insecurities, uncertainties about employment or the future, even our walk with God. You know, there are no shortage of things that weigh us down. Max Licato, a very famous writer and pastor, he tells a story about a parakeet named Chippy. And he says, one moment Chippy was peacefully perched on his cage, the next moment he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over, and he never saw it coming. Problem began, Max says, when Chippy's owner decided to clean his cage, and so she got out the vacuum, you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> she removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in Chippy's cage. But then the phone rang, and she turned around to pick it up. And she said she barely said hello when all of a sudden she heard this big swoosh and realized Chippy had gotten sucked in the vacuum. Well, she gasped. She, she put down the phone. She turned off the vacuum, and she hurriedly opened the bag. And there she found Chippy. He was stunned but still alive. Well, of course, he was all covered with dirt and soot, and she didn't know what to do, so Chippy's owner grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, and she held her little parakeet under the faucet with the running water until he was clean again. Problem was, Chippy was now soaked to the bone, so the owner did what any compassionate bird lover would naturally do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted her shivering parakeet with a tornado of hot air. Max says poor Chippy never knew what hit him. <laughs> well, a few days after the trauma, a reporter who had covered this story uh, contacted Chippy's owner to see how he was doing. And well, she told him, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he kind of just sits there and stares. <laughs> And it's not as hard to see why, Licato says. You're sucked in. You're, you're washed up. You're blown over. He says it's enough to steal the song from even the stoutest heart. And sometimes it does. Sometimes the burden that folks are carrying weigh them down so much that they just don't know what to do. And that's, that's one of the reasons the Bible tells us. It says bear one another's burdens. And in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. It's because life is complicated, it's often messy. It's because folks sometimes find themselves in situations dealing with far more than they can handle. And it's because God never, ever meant us to live in spiritual isolation. He never meant us to walk this life of faith alone. Rather, he created us for community, the kind of community where we support one another and hold each other up. Now, as one of the one another sayings, uh, we have to remember this particular command to bear one another's burdens. It's, it's just one more expression of the chief command Jesus gives us to love one another. That's where it all starts. You remember back in June, last month we started this series, and we, we looked at the Last Supper where Jesus tells his disciples, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So these are Jesus' marching orders. 
as he concludes his earthly ministry, that, that we love one another, that we care for one another. And so all these one another commands, whatever they are, are simply this command to love put into action. It's what it looks like on display, which means they can take shape several ways. So for example, I read of a wonderful story this week. You might have caught it in the news. It's about a young man named Walter Carr. He lives in Homewood, Alabama. And Walter was supposed to start a new job on Monday morning with a moving company. But on, on, a, on the night before, Walter's car suddenly broke down, and he, no matter who he called, he could not find a ride to work the next morning, which was, to, of course, to, again, to be his first day on the job. And, of course, you know, that's not the way you want to start out, missing your first day of work. So Walter had run out of options. And so at that point, he decided the only thing he could do was walk. He decided to walk the 20 miles to work, leaving around midnight to make sure he'd make it there on time the next morning. So Walter began his long walk. About 4 a.m., he'd already covered 14 miles, and the police saw him walking along the highway and stopped him and asked what was going on. And when they heard his story, they not only gave Walter a ride the rest of the way, they stopped and brought him breakfast before dropping him off. Well, because of his ride, Walter got there a little earlier than expected and uh, met one of the clients who was coordinating a move, and, and he immediately just jumped in, started to work, refused any invitation to take it easy for all, catch his breath, just dove right in. And the client was so impressed when she heard about Walter's ordeal, how he, how he had walked all that way and, and saw how hard he was working now, that she posted the story on Facebook. And the story on Facebook caught the attention of the company's CEO. And the CEO tweeted how proud he was of Walter and that he would personally thank him later that week, which he did when he came by and he presented 20-year-old Walter with the keys to his own car, stating that he couldn't think of a better way to part with his vehicle and put it to better use. So a 20-year-old kid whose car breaks down, decides to walk eight hours to work, and the company CEO gifts him with his own vehicle. You know, you know what that's called? That's not only called amazing, that's called bearing one another's burdens. And it's a beautiful thing to see. But bearing our burdens, one another's burdens, it's not only just about being helpful and, and being there for one another when we're burdened by the random events of life, but but it's also, and it's especially, when we find ourselves burdened by sin. This is the context that Paul frames this passage. Hey, listen again what he says. He says, brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, there's a lot to unpack here in just two short verses. For example, the grammar Paul uses is, is very interesting. Uh, the grammar suggests that what he means by someone caught in sin is, is something in which uh, someone falls into unawares so through maybe their own weakness, uh, stupid decisions, self-inflicted wounds, the, the brokenness that might come by trauma or deep-seated hurts. And so it's not something that, that's always deliberate or, 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 or intentional. It could be sometimes, but, but a lot of times it's talking someone who stumbles in a sin. And Paul says that those who are spiritual, in other words, the spiritually mature, he says they should look to restore that fallen brother or sister, the one who stumbled, and to restore them gently. And this word restore comes from a Greek word, kardathizo, where we get our word cathartic, which means to put back into order, and, and literally like a physician resetting a broken bone. But Paul says, do this gently. Do this with full awareness of our own weaknesses and vulnerabilities so that we don't fall into sin too. You know, you might think of it like an intervention, like this deliberate attempt to get someone back on the right track. Paul says that when you bear one another's burdens like that, when you care enough to actually get involved and do something, you're really fulfilling the law of Christ, which is to love one another. See, the, the larger point Paul's making here is that as believers, you and I, we've got a mutual accountability and a responsibility to one another. 
In fact, our relationships right here in this church, our relationships are supposed to reflect God's relationship with us. And so when a brother or sister is struggling, the loving thing to do isn't to just ignore it and hope the problem resolves itself to say, I've got my own problems to deal with, but to confront it and to challenge it with the goal of helping to restore that person to where he or she needs to be. Pastor and author Gene Getz um, tells of a time that he learned someone in a church he served, a good friend in fact, that his friend had left his wife and children and had moved in with his neighbor's wife. And Gene Getz says at first he couldn't believe it. I mean, like I said, the guy was a good friend. He, he was a committed believer. He had actually been a former missionary and had become a successful Christian businessman, even serving on the boards of several Christian organizations. Getz figured, oh, this, this had to be a mistake. But it wasn't. He investigated, and the fact is the guy had left his family, and he was shacking up with his neighbor's wife. And so after visiting the man's wife and children to comfort them and to, and to offer his support, Getz took an elder from the church, and he paid this guy a visit at his place of business. And of course, as you'd naturally expect, the man wanted nothing to do with Gene Getz, and he didn't want to hear anything he had to say. He ordered them to leave his business, and he said he'd been thinking about doing this for a long time, but, but Getz and, and that elder, they refused to go. They flat out said, we're not leaving. And as lovingly as possible, Gene Getz told the man that, that they cared for him too much to let him continue in his present course. The guy wasn't having any of it, and he, he told him to take a hike again. But Getz, at that point, he said, he said to the man that he's literally going to have to deck him. He's going to have to punch him because he had no intention of leaving until they talked this thing out, which is a very bold thing to do because this guy was apparently was a very large individual. And finally, the guy said, you know, he saw they were getting nowhere, so he agreed. He said, okay, okay, I'll talk with you. They went to a nearby restaurant, and for two hours, Gene Getz and that elder, they pleaded with this man to repent and reconcile with his family. Getz said the elder he had with him, he literally had tears in his eyes as he reached across the table, grabbed the man's arm, and begged him to go for counseling. They said they'd even go with him. And to his surprise, the man finally agreed, if only just to end the conversation and get them off his back. Well... True to their word, Gene Getz and the man, that elder, they went with his fellow and his wife to their first counseling appointment. And during the meeting, the guy agreed to go for six more follow-up sessions. And Getz said after that, he didn't hear anything more from the man, although he knew that he was still going to counseling. And then one Sunday in worship, Gene Getz says he looked up, he's at the pulpit, and to his surprise, he saw that man walk into church with his wife. And they sat down together. And following the service, the man made his way up front, and he put his great big arms around Gene Getz, and with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, Gene, thank God you didn't let me go. Thank God you didn't let me go. Well, what would it mean to have somebody say something like that to you? More importantly, what would it mean for them that you wouldn't let them go, that you wouldn't take no for an answer? See, this is what Paul means when he says bear one another's burdens. It's not only about helping folks through the tough spots in their life. It's about walking with them when they're down, when their faith falters, when they don't have the strength enough to carry their burdens alone. And the reason we do this, of course, is because this is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus bore all the burdens of our sin on the cross, all the stuff we're sorry for, ashamed of. He took it on himself, and then he says, come to me, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. And one of the ways he gives us that rest is through one another, through you and me living out our calling as his disciples and living lives of mutual accountability with each other. That's why community is so important. And that's why we're called to work really hard at becoming the covenant community that Christ calls us to be. You see here, and you know, I'll lay it online, if you simply come here on Sundays, sing a few hymns, listen to the sermon, then go home, and you don't make an effort to connect with any other believers throughout the week, uh, you're really not going to get it. Now, now, I'm not saying your salvation's at stake. That's not true. But you, you simply won't grow spiritually healthy the way God intends for you to be. You'll, you'll kind of be like a house plant that doesn't get quite enough water or sunshine. You know, you're getting by, 
but just, just barely. Heard of a pastor tell of a woman who visited his church one Sunday. After the service, the woman introduced herself. This was over in England. And uh, she announced, she said to the pastor, that she had a special ministry. She called it a ministry of encouragement. And what she would do, she would go to a different church every week, she said, to just try and encourage people there with her presence. But as the pastor explained, as, as I thought myself as he told the story, what this woman was doing really wasn't encouraging anybody. It didn't encourage the church. Since she never stuck around long enough to get to know anybody, be part of the church's ministry and mission. And it really couldn't encourage her because her drive by way of doing church never allowed her to form any kind of meaningful relationships and, and sharpen her walk with Jesus. So she was just fooling herself. Or, as I really suspect, she was using just this way as a way of keeping God at a distance. Now, none of this means you've got to be all up in everybody's business. That's not what it means. But at the end of it all, Paul says, he balances out by reminding us that each one should carry their own burdens. But it is a call to be in community with one another. It's a reminder that relationships matter and that one of the main ways the Holy Spirit ministers in this world is through us. But we can't be of service to one another if we don't know one another. And by know, I mean more than superficially. Speaking with a person in church once, um, a church once, someone I consider a good friend, I just happened one day to notice a kind of a particular way this person was relating to one of their children and how you know, it seemed to be making that child resentful, and it's actually kind of pushing them a little bit further away, which, which is the last per- thing this person wanted. They, they, they were so intense in their devotion, loved their child so much, but it was actually just having the opposite effect, you know, this kind of hovering and everything. It was pushing that child a little further away. So, so, so I took a chance. I took a chance as a pastor and as a friend, and I told that person what I had been observing. Now, and I made it clear I wasn't criticizing I made it clear as a parent myself, I was far from perfect, as my own kids will attest. And this person could have told me to go fly a kite and mind my own business. I mean, that's how it is, isn't it? You know, we're loath to get involved with others, and then we wonder why we're so lonely. But but this person really received what I said. And they acknowledged that this was an ongoing area of needed growth in their lives. So so we ended up having this really deep and meaningful conversation. But the reason we could, and the reason I was able to share something that I felt was very important for them, was because we did have a relationship with one another. Let me ask, how do you think that would have been received coming from a stranger? You see, we, we don't just drift into community. It takes effort. It takes work to form meaningful relationships, which then allow us to speak the truth into people's lives. So it's definitely going to require something from you. You whip up a meal for someone who's sick. You drive somebody to a hospital or go see them. You sit with a friend who's grieving. You watch their kids when they're working. You lovingly confront a brother or sister who's falling away from God and gently call them back to Christ. All of it takes time and effort. Some of it involves risk. Maybe more risk than, you know, you want to give. But there's a reason you do it. You know, when I was a kid, my brother, I've got three younger brothers. um, My brother was being picked on by a bully named Bruce. And my father, you see, we didn't grow up in actually the leave it to beaver kind of atmosphere. Um, I don't know what you'd call it. We grew up in something more like MC on MTV. Um, But my father decided to send me out to take care of the problem, which meant that he wanted me to go fight Bruce. I'll tell you the advice my dad gave me, um, (laughs) not leave it to Beaver. He said, ring the doorbell, and when he comes to the door, hit him. (laughs) I'm seriously, man, sometimes I wonder how I got here, you know, just like... So that's what my dad sent me to do. I I kid you not. And, And of course, I didn't want to do that. My brother and I are very close. My brother and I are what they call Irish twins. First of all, we're actually Irish, but we're less than a year apart. And at the, same, at the time, we were virtually the same size. I mean, later on in high school, my brother actually outgrew me, and he became pretty good with his fists. 
me, I was always a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> but, but now I was being sent out to fight the bully. So I trudged down the block and I found Bruce. And summoning all my inner tough guy, I warned Bruce that he better leave my brother alone. And you know what happened? Bruce sheepishly apologized and promised it had never happened again. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not what happened. <laughs> Bruce took one look at me, threw me to the ground, and sat on me. And I might still be there today, except I managed to wiggle free and snatch Bruce's hat, which made him miss the school bus. And that was my big victory for the day, confronting the bully and getting sat on. But you know why I did this? I did it for my brother. And it was hard. And it was difficult to muster up the courage, but ultimately, I did it because of my brother. You know, bearing one another's burdens is a lot like that. It's, a, it's about being there for our brothers and our sisters when they struggle. And honestly, it, it's hard. It takes a lot of wisdom and grace and, and courage to strike the right balance. And, and Paul warns us to watch our attitudes in the process, but again, we do it because it's what Jesus Christ did for us. You know, a number of years ago, there was a man, kind of a crazed man, he rushed into a museum in Amsterdam until he reached a famous painting by Rembrandt. And when he got there, he pulled out a knife and he began slashing the painting until the authorities could intervene and stop him. And, and I remember not too long after that, another man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral and he took out a hammer and he began smashing Michelangelo's sculpture, the, the Piata, which depicts Mary tenderly cradling the crucified Jesus Christ. So in short order, both the Rembrandt and the Michelangelo were severely damaged in these separate attacks. And of course, when the curators saw what had happened, they simply disposed of the damaged works of art and forgot about them. They just tossed them into the trash, right? Well, of course not. Well, why not? Well, because these are, these are masterpieces. They're incredibly valuable works of art. They can't just be thrown away or discarded. They're one of a kind. And so instead of throwing them away after they were damaged, the best experts in the world were called in and working together with painstaking care and precision, they restored these beautiful masterpieces and put them back on display. We well, you know in the same way, you've, you've got to think about yourself. And you've got to think of everybody else around you as a kind of unique masterpiece. Because you are. You are God's masterpiece in all creation. The Bible says you are created in his image. You bear the divine image of the Savior. And even though sin has distorted that image within each and every one of us, Jesus Christ came and gave his life on the cross to undo the damage sin has done to us, the damage we've done to ourselves by personally bearing the burdens of our sins that we might be born again. The simple fact is, the life Jesus led, the death he died, and his victory over the grave showed us that there are no throwaway people. There are people, there are no people who don't matter. Rather, there are damaged masterpieces whom God intends to restore. And so this command to bear one another's burdens is the reminder that each one of us matter eternally to God. And what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, we are now called to do in smaller ways for one another. Becoming a reflection of the kind of love and relationship that God wants with each one of us. And the relationship he made possible through Jesus Christ, his son. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus the one who came to undo the damage, Lord, that sin has done to us and we've done to ourselves. Father, we forget that we're made in your image. 
Lord, that each person here today, each person in the world, bears your divine image, Lord, and, and, and that image has been distorted and marred by sin, and Lord, and, and some still persist in that sin, Lord, and don't know the salvation you offer. But Lord, you also call us, each of us, Lord, once we've received your salvation, once we've been born again, renewed by your Spirit, to be vessels, Lord, of healing and restoration and wholeness for others, Lord, because you work through us. And so, Lord, teach us properly what this means to love one another by bearing each other's burdens. Father, help us, Lord, to have the right balance, Lord, to know, Lord, when helping is good, Lord, also to know when helping hurts, to just be there, Lord, with the unique gifts and talents and abilities, Lord, and, and Lord, to start, Lord, not only in our families, but in our church family as well. And the Lord, from that, to, to bridge out into the larger community that people may see and be attracted to you, Lord, and know there is a God in heaven, a Savior who loves them. Help us live that out, Lord, here in this church community. And Lord, we pray for our church that we may be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. We pray for one another, Lord, our friends and our families. We, we pray for Christy, Lord, for her surgery this week, Lord, and pray, Lord, that you'd bless her and the, bless the doctors and already speed her healing. Thank you for Mark, Lord, and for the good report he's gotten and for his health and wholeness, Lord, for, for Jenny's mom, Lord, for her procedure, Lord, for each one of us, whatever burdens we're carrying, Lord, whether they're known or unknown, Lord, we pray for our joys, too. We pray for all our expectant moms, Lord. We pray for Jill Wilde's expecting delivery and, Lord, every other, every other mom who's expecting with anticipation, Lord, and their families, bless them and keep them, Lord. And help us walk together with, Lord, joy, concern, and closeness because that's the way you walk with us. And so hear us now, Father, Lord God, as we lift our voices together as one people to pray Christ, the way Christ our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing our second hymn this morning, This is Amazing Grace. <laughs>